comedy is so much about rhythm. It's very musical. And like performers have their own rhythms and ways of speaking. So who am I to say to someone who's maybe struggling with a script for no other reason than it just doesn't quite fit in their mouth for whatever reason? And they're saying to me, can I not just say this? Of course they can. You know, it's whatever conveys the meaning. I, I'm not writing Shakespeare, so I'm not really, really precious about individual words. As long as the meaning is the same, like, yeah. why wouldn't you let people just go for it and be funny in their own way? I don't know how many people know about the background of the film, but in a nutshell, I, I, I really had to be dragged kicking in and screaming into making a film. Because I did want to make a film, but I didn't want to do it pregnant, necessarily. Um, and so I almost made the film out of a kind of annoyance and irritation that someone was asking me to do something. And I was like, oh God, leave me alone. And then I was like, oh, actually, maybe I should do this because I'm a freelancer. And the government really treats freelancers really well, as we know from the recent budget. Um, and I, you know, I was just terrified about maternity leave, really, and what was going to happen to my career, and all of that kind of thing. So um, I kind of thought, what can I do? What kind of character would I play whilst pregnant? And I decided that I would do it like a revenge sort of spree thriller <laughs> you know as you do and uh, like jokingly I said to the execs like oh we'd call it re uh, revenge like pregnancy plus revenge and I was like that's rubbish we won't use it <laughs> we'll call it something else that'll be a working title but it just stuck and uh, we couldn't it's get catchy. rid of it it's so catchy it's catchy you sort of remember it you are actually seven and a half months pregnant in it like, yes. that is actually your bump but it's interesting when people say like, are you like the character? And I feel like that is quite a, when it's a woman, when it's a female actress, people are more likely to be like, is it, has it come from a place of like <laughs> autobiographical or whatever? But um, I was just thinking that about even like something like Girls, when people think that Lena's Hannah and they think all of the characters are all merged in, but mm. you're obviously not like Ruth because you don't murder no, people. No, I mean, it's interesting. <laughs> no, I don't murder people. As far as we know, I've not been caught <laughs> thus far. Um, yeah, I mean, I know what you mean. I, in some ways, though, I would say that most of my work is, it comes from an element of me. It's from a part of me. Um, but yeah, it is kind of a, a psychological controlled experiment. It's not like I'm this crazy sort of... People sort of sometimes say to me, oh, God, you must have had a horrible pregnancy. I'm like, no, I had a lovely pregnancy. It was really nice. But you wouldn't know that from watching the film. Yeah, not, not necessarily. Because <laughs> it's quite dark, you know, in content. But I kind of think that I exorcised all of the scary things about pregnancy by making the film. Yeah. Because it was like all the things I was worried about, I made the film about it, and then it, those things didn't happen. When we talk about the film, I didn't know it was made in 11 days. I know yeah. that you were on a deadline, because obviously you were going to give birth quite yeah. soon. But um, you also made a film before that, uh, The B Black Mountain Poets, and that yeah. was made in five days. Yeah. I don't know much about filmmaking. <laughs> I have been on a set once, and I was like, wow, there's so many people here. Um, it was that intense? Um, do you prefer working like that? Um, I do quite like working like that. I mean, I've worked on low-budget stuff for a long time. So for me, the idea of, you know, work, keeping working with your wits about you and having to think laterally and... Um, having to work really quickly and you're, you're sort of relying on the performances but there's a kind of adrenalised atmosphere. Um, I like that. I think, you you know, if you haven't got million, multi-million dollar explosions and special effects, what you have got, got is a kind of urgency in the performance and you do see a kind of tension when... Because sometimes we were just doing it with one take, you know, it was like, guys, we've, you know, we've got to get this now with this shot. And, and the actors do deliver. It's, it's more like a bit of theatre. And what happens is the crew around you are really also like, are we going to get it? And they become really invested in the performances rather than people just being like, you know, what's going on? All right, they're still doing that scene. You know, and they're not as bothered. They're just like, when's lunch? Yeah. Sort of thing. Um, <laughs> it's a bit mean towards crews, but anyone can get like that. The actors can get like that as well. Like, oh my God, how long is it going to take to relight this? You know, and I don't do any of that. I much prefer to just be keeping working all the time and rather than watching playback I'd rather be shooting again you yeah. know um, so would you say you're not a perfectionist in any way 
No, as in because you could roll with things on the day and it was really flexible and. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I. I would rather roll with stuff really, and I like the excitement of not knowing what's going to happen. It's to me like the script is Plan B, mm. because Plan A is what you're hoping you're going to find that is even better than what you plan to do, yeah. and like it's like this crazy thing where people get really obsessed because they obsess about filmmaking and they watch all of their heroes and the films and they're like look at this shot so I'm going to have this shot that's really important and la, la, la. and you're like there's a rainbow over there and you know that looks amazing why aren't we getting that why are we getting this you know and, and that's how I feel about it that I'm like sometimes you can be so myopic about getting your perfect shot because you're trying to be you're trying to make Citizen Kane which is highly unlikely that you are making Citizen Kane um, you know <laughs> I know, I there might be some geniuses out there that are able to do that, but for me, I'm like, you know, just keep your eyes open and your ears open. Same with performances. There might be something that comes up that is better than mm. what's been scripted or something that's making people laugh, and you just go, why wouldn't you go with that? You know, you can. It's digital. You can, re you can shoot as much as you like. It's not like you're shooting on film where every second counts, you know, and, and means money. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's like you can just keep shooting. Because that was the bit... That I, uh, there was something that I read the other day which made me laugh. There's a bit, no spoilers obviously, but there's a bit in the film with um, some testicles. <laughs> and apparently they were a prop that were like, was just lying around that you threw in. <laughs> I was just thinking, that's crazy that it was literally just a prop that you well, thought, oh, let's just put those in. Well, Steve Oram, who I work with on Sightseers, he'd made a film called R. Um, it's spelled with eight A's and a H. He just decided to make it quite difficult for people to find his film on the internet by <laughs> like, making a, a word that's quite difficult to find. But anyway, he'd used Dan Martin for his special effects, who's a very talented practical special effects designer. And um, he worked on Sightseers as well. And I kind of met up with him and sort of said, look, I've got seven kills here. They've got to be different enough to keep people interested but they've got to be similar enough to all be the same person doing it also it's a pregnant woman doing it so how realistic is it that she could kill someone with a single slash or whatever so you're kind of it's a mixture of sort of practicality but also artist you know you're trying to think cinematically as well um and one of the things he said well i've got a pair of balls left over from <laughs> r and i was like yes we can definitely use that and uh and that was how they got used, because they were just there. That's hilarious. Because there's also the, the, the guy that's kind of like a skeleton painted, and wasn't mm. he, didn't he walk past randomly? He was just a... And then you got a, him to sign a consent form. Yeah, he was like, a gen... in the film. It's some of my, it's my favourite shot. I don't know how many people have actually seen the film, but um, you'll have to go and see it now. But the, there's a shot in it where um, there, it, it's me walking around Cardiff in Hallow at Halloween, and I wanted to shoot genuinely on Halloween we actually couldn't have afforded to do it in any other way I was sort of like I've been to Cardiff on Halloween I know what happens <laughs> and um, if we can get that on camera it'll be amazing and I, there was just this underpass that I was walking down and I'm dressed in a Halloween costume as well and this guy just emerged and I swear he looked exactly like Nicholas Holt as well from uh, Maybe it was him. from Mad Max and other things skins etc um, wearing just like no wallet or anything, just like a skin tight skeleton costume and full skeleton makeup. And he was just walking along like that down this underpass. And I was like, oh my God, we have to shoot this guy. And I was like, chase him, chase him, see if he. And uh, we were like, would you be in the film? He was like, all right. <laughs> and he just sort of did this kind of walk, just did exactly the walk that he does in the film, just eyeballing the camera. And I was just like, oh. <gasps> Oh my god, I love that so much because he's like this weird sort of figure of death or something. Or I was thinking he's like she's meeting death in an underpass, or she's meeting like it's like the ghost of her lover, like that she's crossing by like ships in the night, you know, Orpheus and Eurydice or whatever. I was just like getting really excited about it. But at the end of the day, it was just a complete coincidence of chance that this sort of cinematic moment occurred and we managed to get this guy to sign something. Mm. And like that is thrilling to me. I mean, I love sort of 70s, 60s, 70s filmmakers. And to me, I'm like, that's what it's all about, especially when it's low budget. Why the hell wouldn't you do that? Like, yeah, that's like a kind of life trick, like a top tip. Like, go out, <laughs> do it when it's actually a night. Everyone's going to be dressed up looking really scary for a horror film. Yeah, it's yeah. Genius. And also, you know, I think having a Halloween scene in a horror film could be a bit of a cliche. Unless, I was kind of like, the only thing that's going to elevate this is if it's real people, because it'll be much stranger than we can ever imagine. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it was pretty strange. Is it, do you think it helps that 
it seems like you're quite laid back with throwing things in in that way. Are you from like an improv comedy background? Yeah, Do you think definitely. that impacted it in any way? Yeah, definitely. I would always say that I kind of, I mean, the, you know, as I said, like I prefer there to be something better than the thing you've planned. I, th I always think that there is something that is the perfect thing for that moment. And I'm a bit like that as a performer as well. It's like, you know, if you're doing something and there's a certain magic to it and the crew are laughing, why the hell wouldn't you use that? Because that's like gold dust, you know? And, and sometimes there are those sort of magical moments. So yeah, I've used improv a lot in doing theater and, and uh, sort of device theater when I started out. And also, you know, there are certain directors that really like to use improvisation and, and will let you loose, you know. But to me, it's like comedians, they're not like actors, they're kind of different. They're, you know, it's like actors are like classical musicians and uh, comedians are like jazz musicians. So it's sort of like, why would you be forcing them to play a classical piece when you know that they could give you a solo that would blow your mind? It's, it's sort of like, you know, directing a bunch of comedians. It's like you're trying to make a jazz orchestra. And because to me, like, Comedy is so much about rhythm. It's very musical. And like performers have their own rhythms and ways of speaking. So who am I to say to someone who's maybe struggling with a script for no other reason than it just doesn't quite fit in their mouth for whatever reason? And they're saying to me, can I not just say this? Of course they can. You know, it's whatever conveys the meaning. I, I'm not writing Shakespeare, so I'm not really, really precious about individual words as long as the meaning is the same like yeah. why wouldn't you let people just go for it and be funny in their own way basically because did you um because it seems like that everything's very separate in the film there's moments where you're taken away back kind of and, and it's quite like an emotional journey in a way of something's really scary and then really funny and then quite moving and it is kind of you move around a lot did you film things very separately did the actors know what else was going on yeah, in other was. scenes? Yeah, it was. I mean, I was very conscious when I was writing it that there was going to be different styles of filming and different tones that we were trying to achieve. So there were certain scenes that I was like, I know this will be handheld, so it's going to be more documentary style. I'm more trying to create an impression of realism for the audience. And then there's other bits that are like your money shots that are going to be <laughs> not like in the porn <laughs> sense. But just more in your sort of like, this is going to be a beautiful shot, so it's going to have more composure to it. And, uh, and hopefully people go, oh, this film's got some cinematic aspirations and this is making me think in a slightly different way now that I'm seeing this. And then there's other bits that are special effects that had a lot of practical demands, like you're having to shoot very statically because there's a tube with blood squirting here and you can't move the camera because you'd be able to see it. So there was lots of different styles and lots of different you know, pacing and, and tone, which to me, that was the challenge of shooting a low budget film is, to me, a good film is something that gives you a kind of roller coaster. It gives you a highs and lows. And I kind of had this epiphany about feature films that it's much more like a painting or an album or a novel. It's sort of got to, at the end of it, if you're going to feel satisfied, you need to have feel, felt lots of different tones and emotions. And it's much more about balancing that all out. Um, than, than the story sometimes. Story is important as well, but I do think, you know, to me it was about creating textures and sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's mm -hmm. slow, sometimes it's sad, sometimes it's happy. And that was just a bit of a labor of love in the edit. And, and it just meant that sound and music were really tantamount to making the film work, basically. Is that why you like kind of um, mixing the comedy and the horror? Because I was surprised watching the film that I could be so scared and I mean you're so scary in it and you're <laughs> killing people in very um, ambitious ways but then I'm ambitious. laughing so much as well and, and it's like I was just confused at these two emotions <laughs> that could, could exist together but is that kind of why you wanted to do it because it could just be a horror yeah I mean I've got a thing about female characters as well that I kind of feel like there's a lot of under ambition uh, and underestimating the audience in terms of how far they'll go with a female character. And I think that women are very complex. I think that human beings are very complex, but you often are confronted as an actress with very underwritten female characters that only have one level or one message, you know. They don't have anything else going on. So I kind of, you know, it's a little bit of a a thing that I'm attempting to kind of take an audience on a, on a complex journey with a female character that is making you feel all those complex, conflicting emotions that you 
are just like, oh my God, I, for some reason I still want her to kill this guy. I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> like, and then I'm sort of challenging you to, to sympathise with her, even though she's doing wrong things. And sort of trying to prove really to almost like the film industry, like people will go with a female character that does this. Like yeah. people have more empathy for female characters than you think. Um, but it's not like that one female character has to be all female characters because that's no. one thing as well is it's like it's, yes it's one pregnant woman but if, if anyone tries to draw any sort of conclusion that like women are like this it seems yeah. really weird because yeah. it's just one very unique person well that's the point I was trying to make with the film that it is like an individual story and I think you know I sort of talk about Taxi Driver quite a lot in relation to the film because that was one of the inspirations I was just a bit like nobody watches Taxi Driver and thinks this is really rude to all taxi drivers. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, whoa, she's really bringing us down as a, you know, by making this film about taxi drivers, it really makes us seem like we're terrible. Or even making the same assumption about men. Like, wow, that's such a terrible film about men as if all men would shave their hair like that and go out and shoot people, you know. And... But people do make those assumptions about female characters. They sort of go, what are you trying to say? You're trying to say that all pregnant women are going to kill people or whatever. I mean, I haven't had really much of that at all, which is really refreshing and good. But, um, yeah, that was kind of one of the things that I was really trying to show is that you don't... It's just one person's story. It's idiosyncratic. And if we're going to... You know, there's a big sort of issue about is there enough female directors? And... Uh, I remember meeting this guy at a, some sort of film festival party and he was like, oh, it's great to talk to you because we're setting up this body where we're funding uh, female film directors. Um, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's great. And he was like, you know, but it has to be the right project. It can't just be any old project. It has to be the right project. And I was like, right, so you're censoring women's creativity. <laughs> you're saying, here you go, female directors. Here's some money to make your films. But no, you can't make it about that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't like that, uh, uh, you know. Whoever, whoever it is forming this board. But I do think there was an irony in that. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to challenge as well. It's like, you know, in some ways I could have tried to make a film like Suffragette and possibly would have won some more awards or whatever because people would have been like, oh, that's what we need. Women making films about really worthy women. I'm not dissing Sir Suffragette, by the way. I'm sure it's a great film. I haven't actually seen it yet. That's terrible. Uh, but, I, you know, you, you got just got to kind of go women have to be able to be creative and if I want to make a film about a woman that's bad I should mm. be able to do that as well if I want to make a film that's commercial and is a slasher film yeah. why shouldn't I you know yeah and it is weird how um you know you know potentially people could think oh she's a pregnant lady you know maybe she's maybe she's boring now or something mm. or she's just a mum and that's the thing where one of my friends who um is pregnant at the moment she said that she just feels invisible yeah. Like in the office, like no one looks at her anymore. And she was saying that on, you know, she just wants to get like a little wink or something. Um, but she feels yeah, totally I mean, ignored. That's kind of some of the themes in the film. I was like, well, you know, if you had to turn all of these things about, about being a woman or be, being pregnant into a superpower, like invisibility is one of them. I mean, it's, it's really weird. It's like if I've got a pram, I'm invisible as well, except for the people that hate you because you've got a pram. Um, <laughs> Or and like it's like a wheelie suitcase. Yeah, and then sometimes I come out by myself and I'm like, that guy's just like smile at me. Like, because you're so used to being invisible once you're a mum. Like, people are just like, like that. You're just like, I think that guy's like checking me out. Oh my God, what's going on? This is insane. And like, you forget because you're just a mum all the time and you've just got this like pram. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, there's like funny, funny stuff that does happen like that. But I kind of was interested in that and felt like, why does that need to be... Sometimes it's nice to be invisible. I actually feel that as a woman, that, you know, some of your... The elements of being a woman is you can look really different and you can change how people... The appearance is such a key thing for a woman in a way that it isn't for men. That, But you can manipulate that if you want to. I think that's why so many pop stars are female is because fem women use that power of transformation, get the odd exception like David Bowie or whatever, but... You know, that there's a power in it. And um, the fact that women can be pregnant or not pregnant or attractive or not attractive. And, and, and what if we decided to use that for its powers instead of assuming that it's something that is going to create victimhood with it, within you, you know? And so that was, there was those sort of elements within the film as well. So um, It's so funny in the film where, because there's a few bits where you, you do get a little bit teary because it's the story of the character, like she's not having a great time. 
And then just as you're about to be like, oh, I'm so kind of warm and fuzzy, like something really kind of terrible happens. And you're like, oh, okay, I'm not feeling warm and fuzzy anymore. And I don't is- think I could allow you to feel warm and fuzzy. That would have been against my sort of pregnancy agenda for the film. I was like... I'm not allowing sentiment to creep yeah. in too much. But I did want a bit of a sentiment. I was a bit like, you know, I think comedy horror is quite an established thing. It's quite a British thing. But I did feel like I want there to be a pathos element. And I, that was the risky element, actually, of making that work because we didn't really know if people would, would accept that. So you feeling sorry for the character or feeling sad or, or even just having a little think about what it all means, that was quite a risk, really, to take with the film. Mm. But I do think that that was what gave it a bit of a wider um, journey that it could go on because it got into Venice, which is a very serious film festival. And sometimes I think, oh, it's because we did put some stuff in it that we allowed it to be emotional and we allowed the audience to have a sort of time of con- contemplating what is, what is this character going through? It doesn't have to be funny or scary. It could be just like a human dilemma that we feel like we understand or empathise with. Yeah. 